I don't know if that's a crowd. I don't even know if they had a quorum. There was about four of them there, uh, but they were there supporting R. Kelly. Uh, let me bring in Court TV legal correspondent uh, Julia Janet, who's joining us live from Brooklyn tonight. There's a nice mural that was done on the ground there. So, Julia Janet, there are some passionate R. Kelly fans there, uh, but not necessarily there in huge numbers. Right. I wouldn't call it a crowd, but yes, that sidewalk art was there this morning and we're on day six now. So pretty surprising that uh, still there are the supporters who are doing creative things outside of the courthouse. You have a core group of people who continue to go in and watch this trial. We haven't heard as much music outside. We were hearing people here with speakers playing I Believe I Can Fly and other R. Kelly hits all day. That has died down some, but we did speak to two women who said that they were R. Kelly's sisters. Uh, here's what they had to say. We don't believe, we don't believe, we don't believe any, any of that. We don't believe any of that. We, you know, we believe the evidence. Yes. That's, but that speaks volumes, yeah. the evidence. Yes. And so the evidence show, shows that he's innocent. He didn't do all these crimes and everything, you know, that's tainted him. And so we just believe in the evidence. Yes. And we know he's, he's going to come out okay. Yes. And Vinny, we have been hearing the chants, the free R. Kelly, the media is telling lies. Where were the parents? We hear that often outside in front of this federal courthouse. All right, let's talk about what's happening inside the courtroom now. Jane Doe, number five, um, finally completing her testimony today. After three days, she testified uh, first on direct examination about being slapped and choked and confined to a room for several days going uh, through abuse during this four to five year relationship she had with the defendant that started when she was 17 years old and on cross examination. She underwent a lot of questions about her motives, her parents motives and why they consented to parts of this relationship. But redirect by Assistant U.S. Attorney Elizabeth Geddes ended on a very powerful note. Take a look at what they ended on. And I'll tell you, the witness was getting more and more emotional as she responded to these questions. The prosecutor asked her, who was it who exposed you to a sexually transmitted disease without your consent, your parents or the defendant? Jane Doe number five said the defendant. And who was it that had sexual contact with you when you were 17 years old, your parents or the defendant. She said the defendant. And who directed you to have sexual contact with other women and men at his discretion, your parents or the defendant? The witness in tears at that point saying the defendant. And Geddes telling this court, nothing further, your honor. So a pretty strong point to end on after a couple of days of really tough questions on cross-examination for this witness. Yeah, it, it's never easy uh, for accusers. Never easy, and this, this was tough stuff. Uh, but it seemed that the defense was trying to put the parents on trial there for a moment. All right, Julie Janae, stand by. I've got more questions for you. Bring back in our think tank, Eklund Mercy, Nima Romani, and Kirk Nurmi back with us. Eklund Mercy, let me ask you a question. Um, Michael Jackson, king of pop, there, there are, you know, <laughs> the only one else, you know, if Elvis was on trial back in the day or someone to that, or a Beatle or someone like that, right? Uh, this is R. Mm -hmm. Kelly. Um, at this point, uh, do you consider him still a famous celebrity who gets the benefit that celebrities get in trials? We've seen it time and time again here on Court TV through the years. It always happens. Or is he more infamous now than he is a famous celebrity? Um, my my thoughts on celebrity and freedom kind of went away with Mark. If you can arrest and um, imprison Martha Stewart, you can do anything. So I, I don't give any credence to that. But with regards to R. Kelly, I think it's infamy because he did get off. Um, he was acquitted his first trial and there was a whole video. And now we have this. So I am curious. But again, he, a Grammy Award winning performer. I mean, there are people who have their weddings. You know, he is singing wedding songs. He is, he was there for, you know, christenings and P 
people walking for their first time. So it's really a lot of emotions tied to this man. Good is bad. So um, it's really difficult to say. Like it's it's a it's a lot of feelings, but I do believe it's infamy. But with regards to him um, getting the benefit of the doubt, if they could throw Martha Stewart in prison, they can absolutely throw R. Kelly in prison. Okay, Kirk Nurmi, um, let me ask you about the, the tactics that the defense, uh, uh, in, in the cross-examination of this witness, they were seemingly putting the parents on trial and, and blaming the parents for everything that happened to Jane Doe number 5. And we saw a similar approach, again, going back to Michael Jackson in his case, that the parents were under scrutiny in that case as well. Um, your thoughts about how that is going to play here. I mean, one of the one of the things that came up on cross was that the, the parents of Jane Doe number five um, wanted R. Kelly to sort of invest in this idea for a Bluetooth sex toy that would play R. Kelly music. Yeah, Vinny, you know, I think I don't think that's going to work because the we sex have toy so many... or the cross examination. <laughs> <laughs> the cross examination, I. I, I, I hold no opinion on the uh, invention you, you speak of, Vinny. But um, ultimately, yeah, I think that it's not going to work because we see this systematic dehumanization of these girls across the board. So being able to pick it apart if it was one accuser, that sort of thing, you could attack that one accuser as not being true. But here we have what I think the prosecutors are doing a great job of is showing this systematic scheme, this dehumanization, these using girls as objects of sexual gratification. So you can't just pick one apart and everything else because it's all consistent. We're hearing consistent stories. We're showing almost a, a modus operandi and a same system of treatment. I don't think it's going to work at all, Vinny. Uh, Nima, your, your thoughts about the, the celebrity factor and, and what we often see in these trials is that they look at themselves or paint the picture that they are targets, right? Because they have money, power, influence, fame, all of that. So these sort of people are swirling around their world and perhaps people like these parents trying to take advantage and trying to get some money from them one way or another. Of course, Vinny, and I agree with uh, Kirk and Eklund, but, you know, R. Kelly is no Michael Jackson, and these aren't local prosecutors here in California. These are the feds, and you don't mess with the feds. And these victims were very powerful. Sure, some of them entered into civil settlements and they got money from R. Kelly, but it doesn't change the fact that Jane Doe 5 was forced to eat feces and smear it on her face and was beaten by R. Kelly with an Air Force One and slapped. So let's talk about the things that they didn't cross-examine her on. And we have a lot more victims here than we had in the Michael Jackson case. So I think the sheer overwhelming number of witnesses and their powerful testimony is what's going to get a guilty verdict finally against R. Kelly and put him in federal prison. All right, I want to bring back in uh, Julie Janae. And Julia, there was also a friend of Jane Doe, number five, who testified. Malak Ben Abdallah, she testified today as someone who knew the witness, Jane Doe number five, one of the accusers back in high school. And her, the purpose of her testimony was to show the control that the defendant had over Jane Doe number five while he while she was his live in girlfriend, because uh, these two friends used to text each other all the time. But once she became part of this relationship with the defendant, that all stopped. So here are some of the highlights from her testimony. She said that you, uh, she corroborated rather Jane Doe number five's testimony about those texts that they exchanged in 2015 and 2016. And she described Jane Doe number five's pregnancy scare in October of 2015 when she told her friend that Kelly was making her get an abortion and she was scared to do that. And as Jane Doe number five's messages subsided, the witness reached out several times in November of 2015, trying to reach her. That didn't happen. Here's some of exactly what those text messages said, where Jane Doe number five is telling her friend, you know, y'all can't do that because he checks my phone. He's going to be like, why is that your BF or your best friend, boyfriend, when you said you were texting with your cousin? 
that's something that she testified Jane Doe number five had to explain her away as a cousin. And she said, I don't want to have to block your number. I have to show some age now that I'm with a 48 year old man. I don't want to ruin the one shot I have to speaking to you. This all going to those extremely strict and dehumanizing and isolate isolating uh, rules that the prosecution says the defendant had for the woman in his life. All right, Julie Janae in Brooklyn, New York. The trial continues tomorrow. Thank you so much. Still ahead.